whoever yeah. done yeah. that one. <laughs> About one dollar for your watch. Yeah, oh. that's about how my daughter gave for it. <laughs> oh, it's just fortunate that there's anything at all left. We tra travel hundreds of miles across barren sand dunes without a single vehicle track nor human track. Then we find an old river bottom, and here we find the first signs of human inhabitants. These circles are camel thorns piled high around the perimeter of where they keep their cattle at night. This keeps the cattle from being eaten by the lions. The cattle are their most prized possessions, and the biggest share of their diet is a mixture of blood and milk from these cattle. As the wheel goes down and we make our final approach, at the little airport at Camberley, South Africa, a quick glance out the window, and I see the largest open pit diamond mine in the entire world. It got so deep they could no longer retrieve the diamonds from it. We'll pull up to the airport, and then we'll make the final leg of our journey in a pickup as the Coxes pick us up and we'll be staying with them. Charlie, one of the members of the great hunters of South Africa, opens the gate. The next morning we go out and we see numerous game animals, more than you can count, giraffes and hartebeests, and even a big old mean-looking warthog. We're heading out to a site where there's some Ancient rock art is thought to be two to four thousand years old, which I said, well, that's pretty old. They said, no, it's not really very old for here. After you're done with this spot, we'll right take by a you water to another hole. one, and the rock art will be coming up here real soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you say that is an eland. Yeah. Yeah, boy, that's a good one. They really put a lot of work in. They put a lot of work into me. Big eland, that's very, very good work. On the rock in front of me, there's just a, just an excellent likeness of an owl. It's just very, very good art, and it's made with the same technique as our American Indians made theirs. The likeness right in front of me is, is of a hip, hippopotamus, and also some other animals on the rocks there. Oh, the rhino's over there, huh? Yeah, okay. A real good picture, look at his snout. Yeah. Oh boy, that is a good... A rhino. Good rhino, yeah. Nifty, whoever yeah, done yeah. that one. Very, very good work on that. And then look at the little people. Perfect. Where are the people? This oh. person. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like a black world of meat. And what's this one here? Oh, a rhino? Mm-hmm. Yeah, something made the government there. Yeah. The data was just stalking. On this rock we find the likeness of a hyena. Very, very good. Another Elan's likeness is on this rock. And Let's see, what's on this one? Oh, an ostrich, yeah? Uh, Jason, it looks like an elephant. Oh, it yeah. sure is. That's got to be an elephant. Please. Yeah, that, that's yes, definitely... There's an elephant on this one, Marge. This is... Guys, you come over. Hmm. 
Yes, a whole bunch of them. Watch the the. It looks like a jackal. These are the likeness of the sun here. Yeah. Uh, that looks like a zebra. Yeah. Oh, I haven't seen that one. Yeah. Yeah, perfect likeness of a zebra. These are. Uh, Two mountain reed buck. This is a a little fountain where we think perhaps the bushmen used to come and camp at the water site and do their little drawings on the rocks and maybe get animals that came to drink water. Oh, I'll bet you they did. I'll bet this would have been a a real good place to have hunted and they could have uh, snuck up on them and got a poison arrow in them real easily. This site is is even older than the one we visited before. Is this one of the places where they lived in this hole? That's where the anthropologist have, have excavated a, a site there. The formation of calcrete deposits have preserved these stone tools made by Achelian people between 80,000 and 100,000 years ago. Excavations carried out in 1963 revealed the tools which were abandoned in the edge of a fresh water supply. The tools have been left in the exact positions in which they were found. Do you, do you see any at all here? I guess I don't recognize them. Right there on that little stone, where they had something. Oh. Yeah, it's right below that dark one. The dark ones are tools. Do you have any idea what that could have possibly been used for? Uh, yeah. Maybe. Look at here, Tom. You can they see on this little... Maybe they were like a sun right there on that piece of rock. See? It's terrible that they broke that up. Can you see it right there on that one? There's a couple rocks there or something on it. Right here. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. It looks like there might have been something on that one up there between those two. Yeah. Okay, I got it on. Now. Achillean people. Achillean what? people. The Achillean people were what lived here. <laughs> okay. It must have been some sort of a bush. What was it you were talking about, Tom? We were trying to find out what tribe Charles's people was from. Oh! Do they call them tribes? Father and his mother were Bushmen. Oh, they were? Yeah. Uh-huh. From this area? Yes, yes from this area. Oh, yes. Yeah. And the same for no? Yeah. The same for no one, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. 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 Live Bushmen. Live Bushmen. Rikwa. Rikwa, yeah. Because his mother and his father were both Greek ones. That's a, that's a tribe of the Bushmen, yes. But oh. they, they moved further. These got more civilized than the Bushmen. Did. And they had their own language, very close to the Bushmen language. But they got the only like that as well. You see these guys who have a yellow complexion. Uh -huh. They're the same size as the Bushmen. Yeah. But right. the Bushmen was just very scornier. Oh, you can have a stomach on them, so... <laughs> yeah. yeah, and they were the great hunters of South Africa then, were they? Yes. Yeah, yes. game hunters? Oh, yeah, that's me. Oh, how are you today, Billy? Yeah. All right, all right, sir. The people that work for us, <coughs> different families on our property, 
Could I try that now, Gladys? No, no, is the boss in your house? Yeah, all the time or just some of the time? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's being coached from over there, huh? To board our South Africa airline and head back home. Our next trip will be to see some petroglyphs in our own state of Oregon, out in the southeast corner of Oregon, and we're taking our grandkids. Our service road 18, about half a mile southwest of Skeleton Cave. It appears to be about the same age as Skeleton, but it's shorter, and its roof is much thinner. Like Skeleton, the only entrance created is a short up tube and long down tube segments. A considerable pile of debris has accumulated beneath the small entrance which overhangs all around and probably includes the remains of many logs and ladders used before the Forest Service built the stairway in 1969. In the 70s, a very sturdy steel railing was installed around the entrance. Boyd Cave's roof is so thin that plant roots penetrate into the cave and large quantities of sand are trickling in through contraction joints at several points. Collapse is minimal and many original features remain. Small alcoves are present all along the tube, which may be either cut banks or branches which fail to drain. About two-thirds of the way to the end, partial drainage left a solid basalt crawlway about one foot high, beyond which walking passage continues. For many years it was known in caving circles as Coyote Butte Cave, but the name Boyd was certified by a Forest Service publication around 1970. Well, as soon as Marge gets here, then we'll go on down. We enter the darkness of the cave, only lit up by Rachel's small flashlight. And we get down in there, and they're quite impressed with the size of the cave. And this cave was used by Native Americans for some time. There's some evidence of it that the Forest Service has found in the cave. Bones they have eaten and different other things, that tools and other things. Now we're just coming out of the big cave. We're going in the ice cave. What did you think of the cave? It was good. In 1928, Walter J. Perry, a government forester, became interested in the cave. He is reported to have mapped it, found the main passage to be 3,036 feet and the side passage to be 700 feet, a, very, a fairly accurate result. Unfortunately, the location of this map is not known. Perry was so intrigued by the many bones that he sent samples to the Smithsonian Institution. J.W. Gidley of the Smithsonian identified teeth found in the cave as, though, as those of a Pleistocene bear, one-third larger than any living species. And in 1929, he traveled west to meet Perry to examine the cave. Even though the cave was then locally well known, plenty of bones remained for examination. The remains of an extinct horse, a large hyena like dog, and a large bear were inventoried. In addition, there were the bones of deer, modern horse, and a small fox, never before known to have ranged in Oregon. Brogan had indeed named the cave well. There was much speculation at the time over how so many bones accumulated in the cave. It was thought that over that perhaps they had somehow rattled down through the contraction cracks in the ceiling. We cannot know, of course, whether the entrance was a natural trap for non-climbing animals during Pleistocene times. But no matter, for many, most of the bones could easily have been the remains of the prey of predator, predatory animals, which we now know can do negotiate entrances like that of Skeleton Cave with E. What a wonderful opportunity to go in this cave, and it's, it's basically huge. 
We didn't have great flashlights. The kids had a couple little ones, but not really good enough lights for it. If we go back another time, we'll take lanterns so we can see better in the cave. The Arnold system. At 2,700 feet map length, it is about 1,100 feet longer than the long, next longest. Its largest cross sections are wider and higher than any other known cave in the system, and it is rugged. Anyone making the round trip to the end will easily understand why it was overestimated as a 5,000 foot long rock pile by a caver who paced its length. The developed length is about 3,200 feet, the first two thirds up and down over massive piles of breakdown. The back part, about one third its original length, is mostly original, and it ends as the ceiling curves down to meet the floor beneath the breakdown raft. About 500 feet beyond the entrance, collapse has progressed upward to create a small skylight widely known as Dark Hole. This skylight became a legend following a 1924 Oregonian story describing a cave entrance emitting an icy blast so strong as to carry light articles thrown therein aloft. Also known as Wind Hole, it is probably the origin of the Wind Cave's name. Seasonal ice forms beneath the Dark Hole. It's thought that this was used by prehistoric man. What an excellent place to call home, except for that wind blast coming out of there. might be a little chilly in the winter. The Arnold System, referred to in the past as Crook County Ice Caves. The location is well marked on all maps of the Bend area, and there are road signs leading there from all major roads and highways. Arnold Ice Cave's entrance is a relatively small opening at the base of a northwest facing cliff about 40 feet high in a large deep sink. The accessible part of the cave is now only about 125 feet long and slopes down steeply to what is now barely recognizable as a small cupola, about 95 feet below the surface. Only near the bottom are features of the original tube present. Looks like we're not going to be able to get in this one at all. It's totally clogged with ice now. Completely full. Yeah. Careful you don't fall in the cave. Jacob. Ruben A. Long, 1898 to 1974. We're at the Fort Rock Cemetery and here's where Rube Long buried. He's the author of the Oregon Desert, and he at one time owned the land where Fort Rock is located and donated it to the state parks. Fort Rock has always been a very important part to early pioneers as well as Stone Age man. It's shaped like a fort, and just west of there about a mile is a very important cave. It's called Cow Cave, and the first evidence of mankind was found here by Dr. Cressman, the father of archaeology in Oregon. And there were all sorts of different bones. On the lowest levels, they found duck bones and fish bones, indicating that the Great Basin still had water in it at the time man lived there. And then as it went on, Prehistoric animal bones were found there, such as three-toed horse and camel bones. And then in the upper levels, more modern bones were found. There was even a mummified baby that had been buried back in there that was found at that time. And so we climb up on Fort Rock and look around, and then it's time to head for Hart Mountain to check out the petroglyphs there. From Fort Rock, we head to Hart Mountain National Antelope Refuge. We see a few deer grazing in the marsh at the foot of Hart Mountain in the early morning light. We'll go down a true track road for about seven miles, cutting off the main road just before you start climbing up into Hart Mountain. It goes down along a really long lake, and at the end of it is where we'll find our petroglyphs. We move past the bunch of deer. The kids are thrilled by them, and then 
we go on down to where we find some giant rocks that have caved off the cliffs above. These are huge rocks. And then uh, it, I, it's thought that man camped around these rocks. And here they did their petroglyphs in the rocks. Rachel? Is that fun? probably a person they they did a lot of the the flower people and I'm not sure what that is maybe that's a, a lizard or something there or maybe it was a coyote and various other animals and people uh, this was probably the bighorn sheep there are many many accounts of that on the rocks around here and this looks like some sort of a dance. There's the full, full crew, and some of them have uh, like more feathers on their hat than others. Part of the social order, or something like this, probably is what it meant. Another bighorn sheep ahead of us, very well may have maybe a result of vandalism. And also, there's some spots around it where bullets have struck the rock. Uh, a pity these sites are being destroyed. Okay, point point to the animal on it, uh, Rachel. What does he look like to you? An antelope. Yeah. Okay. And point to the snakes. Look at the snakes all over the rock. Yeah, those those wiggly lines. Those are the snakes. There's a nice mountain sheep on that one. Yeah. Can you point to that one? Where? Up on the rock right ahead of you. Up there? Yeah. What does that one look like to you there, Rachel? What, this one? Yeah. People? What do they seem to be doing? Dancing or something, aren't they? They're supposed to be dancing. They are. Let's go. Yeah. Go down and find some more packs. Yeah, looks like a whole village. Looks like a whole village, like the Indians. On top of the it looks as though this was a a village site here that they've drawn a picture of, and their people and mountain sheep below. Looks as though an, another mountain sheep. They were very important to the Indians in this area. They uh, used their horns for spoons and various articles and the meat and hide. The big rocks down below are all what the petroglyphs were on, more or less. Uh, there's a cliff up above us, but I don't really see anything on them. Two things? This looks as though the medicine man is here holding two things up, and there's a snake down below. Maybe someone was bitten by a snake. Oh, or a snake. of oh, course, the medicine man. Maybe he's doing something to keep the snakes away. Here's one below him. Oh, yeah. And then here's one kind of that comes out from his face, kind of. Goes up over Gray. there. Uh, yeah, and then there's the sunshine up above. Up above the snake. Yeah. They're sending so, him off to the sky. Gray. Yeah. Gray. This is probably a very, very Gray. spiritual Gray. painting on this rock. There's the medicine man with, with the two things, one in each hand. And Let's see, here's another one of those symbol things. Yeah, whatever they may have meant. And what's that down below? Is that a lizard? or? Well, I can't just tell. Yeah, there's a lizard over on the side of the rock. The game of the area was so very, very important to the Stone Age man that lived here. And we can see this record on the stones wherever we look around here. This definitely must have been a deer with large antlers with others following. 
possibly those are mountain sheep behind. This is a picture of, it looks like someone with a bow and arrow. Some sort of a hunting or a war scene or something like this. And here's another one up overlooking the deer with the bow and arrow. The deer are right below him there. So it is definitely a hunting scene. A baby possibly, and here's some of their some more of their flower people. They're people with flower heads and things like this. And then some more mountain sheep. I'm not sure what this one was to be. And this, this is probably a hunting scene. It looks as though a person with a, with all sorts of headgear on and maybe a bow and arrow. These are more people scenes. Come here, Jacob. On the rock ahead of us is one of the few pictroglyphs that are still that still exists. These are uh, painted on artwork and they've some of these are thousands of years old. They've withstood the test of time. Preservation of the antelope and other wildlife on Hart Mountain. Through the efforts of the Order of the Antelope, a proclamation signed December 21, 1936 by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt firmly and irrevocably established the Hart Mountain Refuge. Hey, Spotted a herd of bighorn sheep here on top of The bighorn sheep are a very curious animal. At first they act as if they're taking off, but not for far. They just go over the hill and come back to take a look to see what we're up to. And each animal has to take his own look as they line up on the skyline right above the cliffs. There's getting to be a fairly good herd of them in Hart Mountain Antelope Refuge. And they're very strictly protected because they are kind of rare this day and age. At one time, they were a very abundant animal, but not anymore. Then we see some of our pronghorns taken to hoof out in front of us. They're what Hart Mountain Antelope Refuge was named for, and it was created to protect these animals. They're our fastest runner in North America, that is, long distance runner. Now it's time to cook. We're cooking some wild game, probably elk hamburger, and we're going to have us a feast right near the hot springs at Hart Mountain. While I was doing some work around camp, I heard a bunch of noise coming from the hot spring. So I better go over and check and see what's going on. And uh-oh, there they are in the hot spring swimming and splashing and laughing. And the water is just perfect. It's uh, fairly deep and the kids are able to dive in it. Then we go on and we see an old buck antelope all by himself laying out in the sagebrush. He decided to get up. By now, it's early fall, and my daughter Annette and I decide to go over and take a look at Hat Point. There's a lookout at Hat Point, and this is the deepest spot of Hell's Canyon. It's supposedly the deepest canyon in the northern hemisphere, right from where we're standing. We can look at it winding down in the canyon below. That's the Snake River. 
This there was a good population of prehistoric Stone Age men in in the Snake River, and when one of them would die down along the river, they would pack his body up and bury him up on top here. And so this is one of the graves of someone that was buried there. And these people aren't extinct at all. They're still doing well. And we they fish in the Columbia River now mostly to make ends meet. And they're pulling in their nets laden heavy with salmon. <laughs>